Hey guys, welcome back. This is episode three of New York and Beyond with me, Christina Kremitis. And in this episode, we are talking all about nutrition. I have a guest on the show with us today. Her name is Maddie Pascarello, and she is a nutritionist and soon to be registered dietitian. With a master's degree in nutrition and years of experience under her belt, I'm so excited to have Maddie on today to discuss the science of food, supplements, everything that we need to know about nutrition and how we can optimize what we're consuming consuming to be our best selves. If you are interested in the nutrition space, you've probably already seen Maddie on Instagram. You may already even follow her. Her Instagram handle is East Coast Health and it is filled with amazing recipes. And I know that you're excited to hear all of the insights that she's going to bring to us today. Right before I bring her in, I do want to remind you to please like and subscribe. Guys, this helps me so much. It really helps me bring more videos like this to you guys. So if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to my channel and please like this video, leave a comment. And if you are listening on the podcast, please subscribe to the podcast and please give it a positive review. This means so much to me and I thank you guys in advance. So with that said, I'm going to bring in Maddie. Hey Maddie. Hey. I'm so happy that you're here with us. We are so excited to hear from you today. So let's just jump right in. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're doing, and what your mission is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on the show. A little background about me. First and foremost, I'm a PR executive working and living in New York City. And like many of us these days, have a couple of side hustles going on. I'm in the process of finishing my dietetic internship to become an RD later this year. And I run, as you mentioned, the food-focused Instagram account, East Coast Health. Also work as a freelance health consultant and brand consultant on the side for a few people in that industry. As far as a mission, I feel like this is a a pretty general and common one, but my mission is and has pretty much always been just to make wellness and health a little bit more fun, a little bit more simple and accessible um, and always delicious. Um, So I share a lot of recipes and content for free on Instagram. And I'm really excited to share more um, about some of the science behind nutrition and why we eat what we eat. Yes, we are so, so excited. I personally, and I know the audience is so excited to hear about all of these details. And I had already mentioned too in your introduction, how amazing everything looks that you post on your Instagram, I will literally be like on my feed drooling at what you make. So I think one of our questions, oh, we do have a question later for your like basic things that you put into your bowls and stuff because they literally look so good, but I'll have to just have patience and wait till we get there for that question. Perfect. So can you tell us about your personal journey, which led you to what you're doing today and how you found food to be a source of wellness and not simply fuel? Yeah, for sure. So I first got into the food world, um, like many of us, I think when I was in college and I started cooking for myself for the first time and had no idea what I was doing. I, I was really lucky to grow up with a mom who cooked home cooked meals for us every single day. We had a home cooked dinner, breakfast, lunch packed for me when I was, you know, in elementary school. So I was super lucky and grew up around food, um, especially Italian food. And so I had definitely been exposed to it. But when I started cooking for my first time, for the first time, I didn't really know where to start. Um, So I started exploring cookbooks. And I was drawn not only to the recipes and to the gorgeous ingredients, but how the food looked on the page and how, you know, a beautiful looking plate of food sort of made you extra hungry and ended up tasting better just as a result of sort of how it looked. So that was sort of what sparked the initial interest. But I was majoring in psychology at the time, um, and I was just taking a few electives in food and nutrition, and I was starting to realize that was my passion. Um, And so I eventually applied to grad school for nutrition, where I got my master's um, in Boston at Tufts. And I love that you mentioned that food isn't just fuel, because that's so accurate. Um, Food is so much more than that in, you know, society and culture. It's a huge part of what brings us together. Um, but it can also be divisive. Food can be really polarizing and nutrition, especially lately, there's a lot of conflicting research. There's a lot of conflicting viewpoints. Um, 
So I think as a consumer of food media and nutrition advice, it can be hard to wade through that. So that's sort of why I got started in all of this. So many amazing points that you make. We're all individuals, right? And people like to think that if they follow the nutrition advice or the fitness advice of their favorite influencer, that they're going to look like them, act like them, you know, that their life is going to be perfect. And first of all, no one's life is perfect. It's all a curated feed. So, I mean, me, especially anything you see isn't what I necessarily eat every single day, or, you know, I definitely throw together lunch nine days out of 10. um, And it doesn't look beautiful. But, you know, I share the content that I share, because I want to inspire people to think a little bit more simply about what they're eating. um, And to know that it can be easier, it doesn't have to be quite so daunting. Amazing. Okay, so let's jump straight into a little bit more of a scientific question. Can you explain for us the difference between macro and micronutrients and the role that each plays in our bodies? Yeah, for sure. So macronutrients, you can think of as sort of the big picture categories or parts of what we eat. And those include fats, carbs and protein, pretty much everyone when they get, you know, to a certain age or level of education has a grasp on what these are. But what's so surprising is that many of us took a long time to understand what they're doing in our bodies. So to break it down at a relatively simple level, macronutrients like fats are responsible for energy stores and cellular growth, as well as insulation and nutrient absorption. Proteins, as many of us know, help to repair and construct our tissues, really important if we're working out a lot, um, but also important just on a day-to-day level, as well as coordination of so many different functions in the body. Um, The list is really endless for protein. And then carbs, potentially the most, you know, controversial macronutrient are sources of quick energy and they help with digestion. So you can think of things like fiber, um, which help you digest your food. Micronutrients, sort of help fill in the gaps between these things is how I like to think about it. So they, there are tons of different micronutrients, um, vitamins and minerals are sort of the big overarching categories. And these help with everything from energy production to immunity, brain health, bone health, tissue repair, um, so many other things too. Amazing. Thank you. I personally think carbs are the most delicious macro (laughs) macro that exists but I might just be biased (laughs) I agree I'm with you and the other thing too that people don't really realize either and I even have to remind myself of it sometimes is I feel like society sort of has villainized fat for a while just recently I feel like fat became trendy again with these keto diets and stuff but if you're eliminating fat from your diet it's important to also realize that Fats are necessary for a lot of nutrient absorption, like you mentioned, but I don't think that a lot of people really understand that. Yeah, exactly. It's so true to have a solid amount of fat in your diet. Like none of us should be, you know, eating a tub of nut butter per day, even though a lot of us do it. (laughs) Um, But fats are so vital and they are at the end of the day, what satiate us. And like you said, they help with nutrient absorption. Um, They play a role in insulating our bodies and making sure that, you know, we have enough tissue to insulate our vital organs, which, you know, like you said, it has just been kind of villainized in the past and now is sort of becoming trendy almost. But yeah, things like butter and, you know, dairy and eggs, if you eat them, um, and fats in general are certainly not something to be feared, even though it's hard to see them like that sometimes. Yeah, great points. There's such a fine line between emphasizing food for wellness and weight management and having it kind of take over your thoughts and become a source of guilt. So as someone who works with food every day and someone who studies it and someone who's showing beautiful photos of it, how do you keep food as a focus while maintaining a healthy relationship with it? Yeah, such a good question. Um, There are a few different ways to do this, but it's a lifelong process, right? Like whether you are on Instagram or Facebook or any other social media platform, food is going to come up every single day. So it's not something that, you know, we shouldn't necessarily push our feelings aside. It's really great to acknowledge how we feel about food and where we're at in our 
wellness and nutrition journey, if it's even something that we're spending time caring about. But I like to think about it like when you're a kid, before you know too much about food or weight or nutrition, you don't walk around worrying about eating a piece of pizza or a brownie, most likely. You're not thinking about guilt. Um, You're not you know, worrying that you have to work off um, something you ate the night before with your workout the next day. So that means that, of course, society is ingraining these things in us and teaching us that we need or telling us that we need to eat a certain way and work out a certain way and be at a certain weight in order to succeed in society. And it's just not true. And the moment you can sort of break free of those thought patterns and habits is sort of when you'll start the journey um, toward more intuitive eating um, and a lifestyle that doesn't, you know, you don't think about food quite as much, or you don't think about it on an obsessive level. And certainly there are some foods that are more health promoting than others. um, But if you see any one food or food group as making or breaking your lifestyle, then that's not a sustainable lifestyle. So I always tell people like your, you know, your health is what you're doing. 80% of the time, right? It's not a week of your life. It's not a night of going out and having an amazing, you know, fun meal with your friends or your family. Um, It's your general lifestyle. And that's what's going to impact your health day to day. You can, you know, meet your goals and still eat carbs and dairy and sugar um, and everything else, which is, I'm sure a lot of people won't agree with me that, you know, you can still eat sugar and bread and everything that you want um, without feeling any sort of guilt about it. But that's just what I believe. Yeah, it's an interesting point. And I I think you really totally nailed that explanation as well. I think it's very important to hear and to continue to remind ourselves that balance is really so important. That, you know, like you said, one day spent indulging does not mean that you've, you know, undid a healthy diet from the from before or that you need to you know make up for it or anything like that I feel like that's so important to mention and intuitive eating you you mentioned intuitive eating as well and I'm wondering if you feel that when you're eating intuitively and kind of just if you're in the mood for something you have it do you feel like that's almost like our body's natural way of getting what we really do need so I would say that intuitive eating is about letting yourself eat the things that you're craving and the things that you want without feeling the need to restrict yourself. Um, Because when you, you know, give in to what you want to eat, then your body is satisfied and it has what it wants. Like maybe your body was telling you that it needed quick carbs. And so you need some rice or a piece of bread or a cookie. Um, If you prevent yourself from having those things, you're just going to crave them more. Um, and you won't feel that satisfaction. So I always say to people who are trying to eat a little bit more intuitively, um, just think about what your body wants at that moment. Um, you know, if it's telling you that it needs a cookie, that's basically the same thing as telling you it needs water. Like it's just giving you a, a signal to consume something specific. And that doesn't mean that you have to eat 20 cookies. Um, but I think letting yourself have the things that you want to have is it's so challenging, but it's sort of the biggest part in all this. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I'll lead into the next question that I have for you with a little bit of a personal anecdote. Um, I, this, this was maybe, I want to say it it must've been at least three years ago, maybe, maybe longer, but I had picked up a book about optimizing your mind pretty much like how to be productive and, you know, trigger all these, these brain waves I didn't have before. And I thought that it was going to be a book about productivity, but it was actually a book about the ketogenic diet. And I drank the Kool-Aid and I really gave it a solid shot for about a year. And I, I had never been as miserable as I was on this diet. Um, I had everything I read seemed so positive about it, but I, found that my body personally does not run as well on just fats as it does on carbs, honestly. So I had to learn that the hard way at pretty much everything that was supposed to happen when you implement this diet worked the opposite in my body. And I just kept trying to push forward thinking like, it's going to kick in soon, it's going to kick in soon. And I was like, it was torture. And I had met with a, um, an endocrinologist, and he was like, 
what are you like, why are you doing this? You should just and he just recommended that I eat balanced and you know, lean protein. And he was like, you there's no need. And he was like, this diet is recommended for people who need it. But he's like, you don't need it. So I stopped and I, you know, went back to normal. But that's my personal anecdote. So my question for you is, how do you feel about restrictive diets? And do you see any value to trying them? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, your anecdote, I think is something so many of us can relate to. I think there's a stat that like 80% of people have tried some kind of diet. And keto is one of the ones that I think is the most like from from an outside perspective, attractive, because the people that are selling it are really good at selling it. Um, But like you said, for so many people, the majority of people, especially women, keto is just not sustainable, we need more carbs and more protein than that. And we need less fat. Um, So, so bad, like that, it's marketed to pretty much everyone as a blanket diet. Um, And I think we really need to refocus our messaging around it. But with regard to elimination diets, specifically, I think there can be value in them if you're working with a medical professional or a dietitian, and you know, or have a, a good feeling that you have a significant food insensitivity or allergy. Um, I have friends who struggle with different digestive issues and who need and have tried to eliminate certain foods just to see what happens and to see if that's what is triggering inflammation in their bodies. Um, so I think at that level, if you are suffering from health problems, then they can be, they can be helpful um, under like medical supervision, not under keto influencer supervision. With that in mind, I don't think that restrictive diets are ever helpful. If you're, you know, trying to eat a little bit more of a high volume, less calorie food in order to lose weight over a long period of time, and you're doing it sustainably, um, again, with an RD or a medical professional, then that can be helpful for people that are trying to lose weight. But for the vast majority of us, elimination diets and diets in general, just don't work. Like there's very little evidence that any of these diets um, that are, you know, so mainstream now are super sustainable over the lifetime and very few of them help you lose weight sustainably. Yeah, all, all great points, honestly. And for our listeners who were with us for the previous episode, episode two, we also did talk about um, our guest on that show said, if you won't give something up for the rest of your life, like if it's not something that you want to cut out for the rest of your life, then don't bother cutting it out for a month. Like if that's not a lifestyle change, that's going to be sustainable or show any result for you. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, it definitely it makes perfect sense. It's funny, because it makes perfect sense when we're talking about it. And then, you know, clickbait articles and things that come up in the news makes you sometimes you're genuinely just bored. And you're like, I want an activity and that it's kind of crazy when changing the way you eat becomes a way to satisfy boredom almost to a certain extent, you know, or trying to self diagnose something when you really should be consulting when we really should be consulting a professional. Yeah, absolutely. I think like they're clickbait for a reason, right? They're trying to get you to read them. And it's totally fine if you do. I consume that kind of media all the time, almost every day. And I have to take a step back and take it with a grain of salt and, you know, look at it with a more critical eye and say, is this something that's actually, you know, bettering my understanding of nutrition to be reading? So true. Thank you for that. So many nutrition scientists will teach that there is more to food than just the burning of calories, but rather the quality of the calorie and the purpose that each nutrient serves in our body. Can you explain this concept to us? And further, can you discuss whether or not we should be considering the calorie in our day to day? Yeah, so I feel like there are sort of two schools of thought. And one is the belief that calories in calories out, right? Like you're only going to lose weight if the amount of calories you're taking in is less than what you're exerting during the day through your basal metabolic rate and your exercise levels. Um, And then there's another school of thought, um, which I think is more prevalent in sort of the academic nutrition world, which is that calories aren't necessarily created equal. um, And that a calorie from fat is different than a calorie protein. And that's true. They're going to behave in different ways um, ways in the body. And that's why I think counting calories can be super damaging to our relationship with food. Um, 
because we're not taking into account where the calories came from and what they're doing, you know, when that gram of protein um, or, you know, hundred calories of bread gets into our body. Um, they all play a different role. They all have, you know, each macronutrient category that we were talking about before has a different amount of calories associated with one gram of that type of macronutrient. So one thing to be mindful of is if you're trying to limit your intake of a certain macronutrient, you know, by limiting calories from, you know, ca processed carbs or limiting calories from fat is what are you replacing it with? Um, and that's, I think, what's at the heart of this sort of scientific discussion is that when you are just having a calorie in calorie out mindset, you might be replacing some of the things that you used to think of as high calorie with things that are lower calorie, but less healthy. Um, so it's, it's definitely a complex topic, but I think, you know, again, it really comes down to, are you eating things that are satiating to you? And are you eating things that make you feel good? Um, cause I think that's, that's honestly what's most important. So true. Uh, that's so true. I I'm never in a worse mood than when I'm trying to not have something I want. Yeah. It's the worst. It's like, you're depriving yourself of it. And then that's all you can think about. Like, I get that way with dessert a lot of the time. Like I need something sweet at the end of the day, just to sort of like signal to my body, like, okay, it's the end of the meal. You finished dinner and in quarantine, especially like I'm having dessert after my lunch now. And I'm like, okay, like that's an interesting development. But I mean, it really goes to show you that our, our cravings and our body's needs change over time and they change in response to so many different things. And I know we'll talk about this later, but you know, if, if you're stressed out, if you're hangry, if you didn't get enough sleep, your what you're eating is going to, you know, change and, and be so different. I totally agree with you. I will confess that I have, I, I want dessert after every single meal. Like I literally want something sweet after breakfast, lunch and dinner. I sometimes I will keep a stash, not sometimes all the time. Who am I kidding? But I will keep a stash of like mini candy bar things because sometimes you just really need it. And if you open the whole entire one, that's like it for you. But I feel like sometimes I'm like, all right, like if I allow a little bit, it's fine. Like it's not that bad. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's really not that bad and it's not that serious. And um, I mean, I do think that, you know, you can, you can teach yourself to snack mindfully and choose options that are a little bit better for you. But just like you said, if you're craving a candy bar and you know, you're not going to be satisfied until you've gotten a little sugar in your body, then preventing yourself from eating it is, is going to make things worse. I will admit though, that when I am well hydrated, like when I am serious about, drinking a good amount of water, I have many less cravings in general, I just feel very healthy, I feel very satisfied. And I feel like I'm above the cravings when I'm well hydrated. Yeah, so true. I think like, unfortunately, it's one of the like the easiest things for us all to implement that would help improve our health. But it's like at the end of the day, if you don't have water next to you, you know, if you're on the go all the time, it's so easy to forget about too. It is. It's so easy to forget about water, but I, I recently started again. I bought a new water bottle and I've been so serious about it because yeah, I'm, I'm like never thirsty, but I'm always dehydrated. <laughs> that's incredible. Like that, that's usually my new year's res resolution every year. And I, I make it every year because I don't like need it every year. So kudos to you. That's pretty incredible. Right. We'll have to, we'll have to be accountability buddies this year. Exactly. I need someone. <laughs> exactly. I feel like that's a big thing in general too. the accountability buddies. I, I feel like having someone that's also trying to achieve the same goals as you makes things so much more enjoyable and so much more doable. Yeah, that's so true. I think like, you know, that's one reason that social media can be great is because it connects you with people who, like you said, might have the same goals as you. Maybe they're trying to eat one extra vegetable per day, or maybe they're trying to start, you know, their day with some fruit on an empty stomach, um, or just a cup of lemon water when they wake up. Um, I think having someone that is going to stick in it with you, like is really underrated and can be so helpful. Yeah, so, so, so true sort of related to what we were just discussing, 
we just got out of the holiday season. During the holidays, we tend to eat more food, more sweets. We drink more alcohol than we typically do during the rest of the year. And I see a lot of people doing dry January detoxes and other elimination tactics to try to kind of make up for damage that was done later in the prior year. Is it possible to make up for prior months of consumption? And do you agree with this mentality of making up for recent eating? Yeah, I mean, that is so tough, right? At the beginning of every new year, we're inundated with detoxes and resets and, you know, branded in different ways, they're all sort of preying on the same thing, the same insecurity um, of needing to undo what we did at the end of the year. And one thing I will say that sort of goes against the idea of like, you know, one month just not being enough is if you're starting the year and you want to do dry January, or um, I know it's also really common to do like vegan January, I think that can actually be really helpful and really sort of informative about our health. Don't put pressure on yourself to make it all 30 days. You know, if you're someone who likes to have a glass of red wine at dinner or, you know, who really, you know, needs to have um, animal protein to meet their, their protein goals, or if that, you know, is what is accessible to you, then, you know, by all means, don't put pressure on yourself. But I think starting out the year with, a couple of changes that you think you might be interested in, um, or that might be sustainable for you long term can be helpful. Um, with that said, I don't think that any sort of detox or, you know, juice cleanse or reset that's marketed is done, you know, with the best of intentions, especially at the beginning of the year. If it's something like you said that you can make sustainable and long term, then by all means, go for it. But you know, a seven day juice cleanse is your body is going to go into shock. Like you're, you're not, your body's not going to know what hit it. It's not going to be meeting most likely its needs for the day. And you will most likely wind up if you do lose weight during that process, or, you know, if you, if you get leaner, it'll most likely study show end up reversing itself um, after you stop that diet. So a long winded explanation, but I definitely feel like these things are marketed to us for a reason. And if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Great points. Those are, those are all really great points. And I, I definitely feel like I agree. I don't think I've, I don't, I don't remember what I did last year, but this year I did not do any type of special program. But I also, also personally speaking, I felt like all of 2020 kind of like being stuck at home was an opportunity for me to, to really try to kick myself into gear and really get on track. So I feel like I did that for myself last year, but that's just a personal thing. So this year, I feel like I wanted to just simply continue more than, you know, do a resolution or change things from top to bottom. Yeah. I mean, your, your resolutions, if you set them can truly be about just maintaining what works. Um, you know, I like to think of it instead of giving something up, you're saying to yourself, what more could I include? Like, could I include more vegetables? Could I, you know, make a, like a hearty salad part of my lunch two days a week? Um, so asking yourself sort of what you can add in, I think is so much less daunting than saying, I'm going to start my year with like a 20 day, like only liquid food diet, like it's just not going to be sustainable. That's such a good point. I love that you mentioned to try to focus on what good things what's what's beneficial that you can add, instead of focusing on what you're going to not get, or what you're gonna what you're going to take away. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely makes it more definitely makes it seem like it's going to be a lot more enjoyable than feeling like you're just going to feel neglected of everything you like. And more fun too, I think. Yeah, totally. Totally. So it's the beginning of 2021 and many people have either started new diets or are trying to take their existing diet more seriously. So how do you recommend that we approach this to maintain our health and allow us to step into a lifestyle that is actually enjoyable and sustainable? Yeah. I mean, I think we've touched on this a little bit, but asking yourself, 
you know, what small changes you can make is great. Um, if you are someone who has taken a look at their overall health and thinks, okay, these are my new goals. I, you know, want to be eating more protein. I want to be eating more leafy green vegetables. Um, I'm trying to snack a little less, trying to drink more water. Um, I always tell people just make a couple of small changes. Like don't daunt yourself by trying to drink two gallons of water every day. Um, or I saw this like trend on TikTok. I think it's like the 75 day hard challenge or something where you do like two workouts a day and cook all your own food. And I'm like, don't try and do that. <laughs> like it will be so overwhelming. Um, so just make a couple of small changes. You know, I always try and vow to, as we said, drink more water, snack more mindfully. This, this is a huge one. Put my phone down during meals, put away technology during meals. I'm so bad at that, but that is one of the things that actually has a huge impact on how we digest. Um, and then things like stress and sleep, um, getting seven to eight hours of sleep a night has profound effect on our hormone levels, which then impacts our digestion and the things that we, you know, eat during the day are sort of willpower to make better choices. Um, and then at it from a stress standpoint affects our metabolism. So, you know, trying to control things that are outside of food is sort of where it starts. Um, and so I would say those two things. So make small changes and then figure out what in your life that's outside of food you can also control um, and sort of start there. Okay. I got so curious when you mentioned technology, consuming technology while you're, or being distracted by technology while you're eating. Can you give us any more details on how that does affect your digestion? Yeah. I mean, from a big picture level, when you're watching T, I mean, it's so tempting, right? We all do it probably at least once a day, especially during quarantine. So truly no shade on anyone because I do this too, but so many of us watch TV or scroll through Instagram, um, or, you know, are doing work at our desks. And we certainly have a culture of working through lunch and, you know, not stopping for two seconds. Um, and uh, some, something that someone I know is doing is just putting their work and their phone aside for 20 minutes at lunchtime, just 20 minutes. And sounds easy, right? But I think for so many of us, it's actually really, really hard to do that. Um, and to your question, what it's doing is your body isn't taking time to ever check in if it's full. Um, you're going to just as you know a default setting, you're going to eat a little bit less mindfully if your attention um, and your brain is focused on a screen in front of you um, rather than your satiety clues, as we say, like when you're feeling, when your stomach starts to feel full, it's sending signals to your brain and your brain needs to be sort of alert and responsive to those to tell you that you're getting full. Okay. This is all too true. <laughs> I feel like when, I feel like sometimes I'll be eating dinner with John, with my husband. And it's literally, it's like, we're at the movies. Like we've got Netflix on, we're just mind mindlessly just like feeding ourselves. And I'm like, you're not really thinking about the meal. You're not really thinking about the food and what, how you mentioned about lunchtime. I was trying to picture like, what would I do? I, it's been so long since I ate a meal without sitting on technology at the same time. I was thinking about lunchtime as you, when you were describing it. And I was like, what would I even like do while eating? Like, would I talk to myself? Like what I, like, what would I think about? Like, it's crazy that this has actually become so foreign to us. I know. I mean, like how weird is that, that we really, we don't even know what we would do. And I think like certainly pre quarantine, we would maybe go out with a friend and we'd have a face to face conversation or, you know, we'd bring food back to the office and eat it in a common room. Um, if you're by yourself, I, I tell people, you know, pick up like a real book or a magazine, um, or just sort of like anything that's not a device. It's so hard. It really is so hard. And, you know, it's not always going to be possible. Sometimes you're going to just have to do it because that's sort of the corporate world that a lot of us work in. But, um, yeah, I think it's just so funny that we really like, we have to think about it, right? Yeah, it's just, it really does feel so foreign, but I, and I also feel like it's sad, but it, personally, it takes a professional telling me that 
to really, you know, I know that I should have less screen time. And I know that, you know, these general things we hear, and we know that they're true, but it takes hearing it live to really be like, Oh, wow, I should definitely make a change. I really should be more intentional about that. So I'm, I mean, I'm definitely going to try, I'm definitely going to try to do that more and be more mindful, especially you're right. I mean, when it was, when we used to be in the office, food was more of a social opportunity. It was like you would go to the kitchen in the office or, you know, now we really are just on the computer the entire day straight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, detrimental for so many reasons that it's, it's become really hard for us to separate ourselves from work into like being at home, but not working. Um, And I think, you know, setting aside a chunk of time where you're not working and you're eating can help you know, even better separate out those times of like pleasure and, um, you know, doing things that are enjoyable and separate them a little bit from work too. Like that can also have beneficial effects. So true. So a lot of us work out regularly and a big component of the fitness lifestyle is powdered supplements and an emphasis on consuming large amounts of protein. So where do you stand on both of these? Yeah. So from a big picture standpoint, if you're someone who's working out for 30 minutes to an hour at home a few times a week, um, and you're not a professional athlete, and you're not running marathons every week, you probably don't need supplements. I like to, you know, suggest probiotics to people, um, because those can have so many benefits, um, and potentially a B12 supplementation if you're vegan. Um, Since I'm not an RD, I could never actually diagnose anyone or, you know, seriously recommend them. But both of those things can have um, benefits as can a multivitamin if you think that you might not be getting enough of something specific, Um, potentially iron if you're vegan, but generally, you know, the supplement industry is a multi-billion dollar industry for a reason. And it like so many other things we've talked about, it um, makes money off of people's insecurities and from, you know, great marketing. And um, the bottom line is that they, you know, you, it, they teach you that you need to have those things if you are working out, but supplements should be just that supplement to your diet. If you're, you know, if you're vegan, or you have certain food intolerances, then that might be a separate conversation. But I think, you know, in terms of general supplementation and protein intake, most of us are probably over consuming protein, especially these days. Um, You know, we don't think of protein on a plate as like the garnish, like a lot of other cultures do. We, you know, consider it to be one of the bigger parts of the plate. Um, And that can lead to a lot of us actually over consuming it. Um, So, you know, if you're someone that thinks you are, then you know, you probably don't need a protein shake added after your workout, as long as you're, you know, getting some something in within a couple of hours, you're probably fine. Okay, this is so interesting to hear, because I, I had I've stopped using all of the supplements that I was using at one point, I like working out, I enjoy working out. I definitely work out every day, aside from weekends. But um, and I do like to get a lot of protein in my I'm sure that we're we'll get to it but I think you'll probably tell me that I'm getting too much but um but I used to use protein shakes and the aminos and it would be like after your workout you need to have the the liquid aminos and a protein shake before or after and what I found was that the protein shake for me is not satisfying I need to chew food like I need to eat something solid for me drinking the protein shake, like I would just want a meal right after. So I had to cut that out because I noticed that I was just over consuming, like from a macro perspective, but also from a calorie perspective. um, These products that are marketed as health foods might not be healthy unless you really need them. And sometimes too, the, the show, the, the artificial sugars and the preservatives in these, um, in these products too. Sometimes I felt personally, I felt like they were going against the whole point of what I was taking them for. Yeah, that's such a good point. I mean, the the amount of like actual junk in most supplement powders, pre workout powders, post workout powders is like it basically negates the 
protein amounts in them. And so, you know, a lot of people do want to like bulk up and they want to gain muscle, but there are so many things you can do before adding a protein shake and especially a protein shake that's, you know, using a protein powder that has a billion and one ingredients in it. Right. I definitely like to look at the labels. I like to make sure that the product has a good reputation, that it is as clean as possible. It's it's very difficult with the with the supplements. I mean, it's it's rare that you're going to find one that doesn't have a lot of additives. But um, but the one thing that I can't quit, honestly, tell me if it's okay. The one thing that I still do take every single morning is the pre workout. It gets me going. And I found one that I feel is pretty clean. I can't like that. If I don't take it, my, I, I suffer through my workout. Yeah. I mean, I feel that I was starting to notice, especially given like my energy levels during, you know, quarantine and working from home that I was like my energy in the morning, which is when I usually like to work out was just totally tapped. And I couldn't, there was nothing I could do to like get myself excited and like, get the motivation. And I was just like, okay, like I'm going to give myself a little break first. And then I did the same thing. Um, I sought out pre-workouts that were like made with as minimal ingredients as possible. Um, at the end of the day, the main, the act, active ingredient in pre-workout is caffeine. So if you are having an espresso or a cup of coffee, it will most likely be doing the exact same thing. Um, and another like trendy ingredient you'll see in a lot of them is BCAAs, which are branch chain amino acids. Um, and people like to take those in during or before their workout, um, as a way of like getting a little bit more protein, but again, probably not needed. So, so workout, BCAAs, even you don't think are for most people. No, it's like, if you're an athlete or, um, you know, like a long distance runner, um, possibly, you know, it's something to talk to your dietitian about, but for the vast majority of us doing at home workouts, we don't need them. And then do you have a ballpark for us that you'd be willing to share? We can scratch this if you don't for someone I'm interested personally for myself and for the audience's benefit, of course, but let's say you're Let's do it for a man and a woman because I want to be open to our entire broad audience. I don't want to just be super self-centered. Um, so 30s, let's say 30s, like late 20s, 30s, um, and you're working out every day and you are looking to build lean muscle. Is there a, is there a, a guideline broad amount that you would say we should be getting for protein? Yeah. So I would say it's, it's pretty easy to calculate this yourself. Um, you generally take your weight in kilograms um, and then you multiply it by anywhere from 0.8 to 1.2. Um, so 0.8 would be, you're not, you know, you don't necessarily have the goal of gaining a ton of muscle. Um, you're just sort of looking to maintain. And then all the way up to 1.2 would be where you sort of start to get to a place where you're really looking to put on muscle. Um, that's a very, very general um, sort of blanket statement. Um, most for most men, they recommend probably 50 to 60 grams of protein per day. Um, and for women, it's a little less than that. So hmm. way, you may be getting more than you need, um, in which case your body just gets rid of it. It's not like used, it's not stored, it's not needed. Um, same goes for carbs and fats too. Your body will just usually sort of get rid of or store what it doesn't actually need to use at that time. Um, so that's, that's what I would say generally. So you might be getting a little more than you need, but it sounds like you're, you're doing pretty well given your goals. Well, it is an interesting point and I'm definitely going to do the calculation and look at it again. Um, because you know, we do have this mentality in our culture where we load up on the protein. And, you know, if you are someone that is conscious of the calories as well, you're spending a lot of them on protein. So you could free some of that up for things that are nutritious, you know, fruits and vegetables, which I know for me, I should have more of. Yeah, absolutely. Like those high volume foods, if you're finding that you're just simply not full, it could mean that um, your body wants more cruciferous vegetables, maybe it wants some added whole grains. So 
you can sort of treat yourself like a guinea pig and try a meal that has a little bit lower protein, but higher vegetables and see how you feel. Interesting. That's cool. I'm going to, I'm going to tinker around a little bit. <laughs> Love it. All right. So leading right into this next question that I have for you is, do you have any preferred sources of protein? Yeah, absolutely. Um, everyday sources for vegan proteins, I definitely recommend tempeh, which is one of my favorites. Um, it's a fermented soy product, tofu, um, chickpeas and beans, nuts and seeds, whatever your favorites are. Um, keeping in mind that nuts and seeds are a little higher in fat, a little lower in protein um, compared to some of the others that I listed. Um, and then things like legumes are really great. Um, if you're not vegan, then Lean proteins are great. Lean ground turkey, um, you know, hormone free um, turkey, like cutlets and chicken, that kind of thing. Um, generally, you know, I try to stay away from red meat and highly processed proteins just because, you know, like we've talked about, they usually have so many unnecessary fillers and, you know, the meat hasn't necessarily been raised sustainably. It's a little bit harder to trace. Um, so those are my, those are my usual go-tos. Yeah, I've been making it. Thank you for that. I've been making it a point to make sure that I know where my protein sources come from. Um, so I've been more strict about where I'm getting the chicken from, if I'm getting chicken at all. And I started to really enjoy, um, I started to really enjoy getting frozen fish fillets. Like I'll pick a lean fish fillet. Sometimes I'll do salmon, but I know salmon's a little bit heavier, but I'll do like cod or, you know, I make sure that it's wild caught. And then it's, they sell them at like, I think the ones I've been getting have been from Whole Foods and they're pretty easy to thaw out as I need them because they're just like one fillet. So I've been enjoying that. Yeah. Fish is an awesome one. Thanks for, thanks for reminding me. I like, I definitely should eat more fish. Um, it's such an easy thing, like you said, to keep around, to keep frozen, um, just defrost it, you know, bit by bit when you need to. Things like shrimp, um, eggs, of course. I probably eat eggs every day. Such an easy, you know, readily available, um, you know, pretty widely accessible protein source. I was going to ask you about that too, because I've been on, a, I get on kicks. Like my husband makes fun of me because he'll be like, you get on kicks and I will have something every single day. And then, so then we'll stock up on it and then I'll never have it again. Like it's crazy. And I do this. So recently I've been having eggs. So I've been enjoying eggs in the morning and I'll usually do like one full egg, like with the yolk. And then I'll add a couple of egg whites to it. Like just take the white of the egg. But my question for you is, cause I also love shrimp and I love shellfish. If I'm having shrimp if I'm having shellfish and eggs on a regular basis am I getting too much cholesterol unlikely um you it's cholesterol is another thing that's like kind of a controversial topic if you're eating you know a couple of eggs in the morning and then you're eating wild caught fish or shellfish in the evening and maybe you had you know a big salad or a green bowl or something like that for lunch you're probably pretty good on the cholesterol front um where people get in trouble is you know eating a ton of red meat you know you're eating like 10 eggs a day might be a little worried but you know if it's overall like is what else are you eating like are the things that you're adding to your eggs or you know serving with your fish like are you adding vegetables um those things help to negate some of the harmful harmful effects of cholesterol. Um, and it's true that we don't necessarily need it added in our diets. Our body produces everything it needs when it comes to cholesterol. But um, you, you know, you don't need to be afraid of eating a few eggs and then having your fish in the evening. I think that's, that's like a perfect balance. Okay. And it's something that I do try to do is have some variety. Like I do, I have read things that say like that you shouldn't just have the same thing. I, I would be inclined to have literally the same thing every single day. It's easy. And if I'm enjoying it at the moment, I would crave it every meal, but I tell myself like I need to incorporate variety. So I'll make sure when I do my grocery shopping that I have different sources of proteins and different types of carbs and grains. Can I ask you one more question that we did not have planned? None of this we had planned. I'm sorry. Of course. No, go so, on. My other question that's coming to me, and I feel like this is going to be, I feel like other people are going to want to know this too, but do you have an opinion on, and if you don't, no worries, but do you have an opinion on 
these, these new types of gluten-free um, pastas that are made with chickpeas and lentils? Do you think that these are processed products that are not as safe? I've been eating them every single day and I kind of just want to know what your thoughts are on them. Yeah. They do have a lot of protein too. Like they're, they're, they're carbs and protein and fiber. No, I think, I personally think they're such a good option. I think like chickpea pasta, lentil pasta, um, there's like all different varieties, right? Now we have like gluten-free options like quinoa and, you know, brown rice. I love them. It makes dinner so easy when your protein is like in your pasta. And that is not to say like, I know people are going to come for me that, you know, are Italian and are like, you're eating protein pasta, like get out of here. But if you are in a pinch and you know that you need protein in your lunch, like think about someone that lives, you know, like a hectic active lifestyle and like can't necessarily spend an hour cooking lunch. Like maybe chickpea pasta is worth that. Um, they are, you know, I would say just as processed as traditional store-bought, you know, pasta would be. And they're just made from a different ingredient. So look for ones that are made from ideally one ingredient like chickpeas um, or brown rice. And it's, you know, it's pulverized into a flour and then made into a pasta just like just like normal pasta would be. So no, I think they're great. And I think they're a really easy way if you are low on protein to get some of that in there. Yeah, especially if you're inclined, like if you don't, if you don't really love meat or animal meat either too, I feel like it's, but of course, like emphasizing what you have been saying earlier too, which is balance, like you're going to balance it out with other healthy things on it or next to it. And I agree that that makes a big difference too. Yeah, exactly. I think like, you know, accessibility and making something that's easy and isn't going to stress you out is just as much a part of it as, you know, what's actually in the dish at the end of the day. So, you know, taking, finding an easier option for something that you love, um, I think is always great. Cool. Okay. Um, well, I'm glad that you gave the thumbs up on that. I was a little nervous because <laughs> I've been guilty of literally having that way too often. All right. So we are all trying to keep our immunity up especially during these winter months now in the face of a pandemic. So of course, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not giving any medical advice, but I've read that making sure that you're getting enough nutrients like vitamin D, vitamin C, and things like zinc are also important to keeping our immune system strong and potentially having less severe symptoms if we were to get sick. So my question is, what is the ideal way to get those required nutrients? And specifically, I'm asking, like, should we be taking supplements? Or are is is regular real food going to give us enough of what we need there? And do you have any particular foods that you recommend that are most rich in those vitamins D, C, and zinc? Yeah, um, God, it's on everyone's minds, right? Um, I think, you know, at this point, there's so much we still don't know about COVID specifically. And so we're generalizing. Um, we're comparing it to other diseases. And we're looking at studies that have been done in the past, again, all correlational. So not necessarily showing like, okay, if you give someone a big dose of zinc, um, then they're going to not get a cold or not get COVID. That's just, we can't, we can't even study that period. Um, and we probably won't know, you know, for a long time, even on a correlational level, um, what sorts of vitamins and minerals specifically impacted, um, people who have harsher health outcomes with COVID now. Um, but I will say that studies do tend to show, um, that, when your immune system is strong, um, you it's because you're healthier overall. So doing things that make you generally more healthy will keep your immune system strong. And that is, you know, likely to have a correlation with better health outcomes and responses to disease. There have been correlations seen with things like zinc, um, vitamin B6, um, vitamins A and C and E, typically things you'd think of when you're like, oh, I feel like I have a cold coming on or, you know, I have a, I have a scratchy throat. I'm going to take some extra vitamin C. Um, iron, copper, selenium too, um, you know, don't get quite as much attention, but are also still important. Um, 
And these can alter immune responses in animals we've seen, um, but we don't necessarily really even know how they're changing immune responses in humans, um, just because we can't study it sort of from an ethical perspective. Um, but to a point of, to your point of supplementation, um, fruits and vegetables have all of these things. Um, for something like zinc or vitamin C, um, you could take a supplement if you're feeling like you're you know, getting sick or you're not feeling so hot, um, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to counteract like getting medical treatment if you need it. Um, so I just want to give that caveat, but um, definitely the more fruits and vegetables you're, you're consuming um, and then also things like getting enough sleep and helping to prevent stress um, can do, you know, just as much, if not more than supplementation can. Um, and then one more thing I'll say is that often with supplements, we get too much. Um, so like with other things, our body just gets rid of them. So it's sort of just a waste of money at the end of the day. You know, that wouldn't apply to every single person out there. There are definitely people who get placed on supplementation to treat certain deficiencies. Um, but overall, that's, that's sort of what I would say. Thanks for that. That definitely gives a little bit of peace of mind because for a while I was thinking like, am I doing enough? Should I be getting these vitamins? Should I be picking up pills that are just like vitamin C or just vitamin D? You've given me some confidence that with a healthy diet and maybe a multivitamin or something like that, like I should be covered. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, you know, women's multivitamin um, or taking iron if you don't need a lot of red meat. Um, B12, like we said, if you're eating, you know, predominantly plant based diet, um, those are all really good, good places to start. Good to know. Thank you so much. So anyone that's seen your Instagram page is well aware. I know I'm so well aware that your smoothie and yogurt bowls that you post look so mouthwatering. <laughs> what is your go to simple ingredient list for a delicious and nourishing bowl? And can you also, I'm going to add to that question and ask you a lot of the things I see that are like fruit based smoothies and things like that. Sometimes I just feel are so sugary. So do you have a recommendation for, um, if that's okay, like do the benefits of the fruit outweigh the fact that it's very sugary or like, do you, do you, do you look at that when it comes to what you're making things like that? Yeah, really great questions. Um, like you said, I think you know, if there are, if you're eating or drinking, I should say a smoothie every day, that's just like solely fruit and nothing else, you could be dripping yourself of, um, you know, getting some extra protein in during that meal or getting a vegetable in during that meal. So I always like to say that, that for smoothies, you know, you almost don't taste, you know, a handful of spinach, a handful of romaine, um, some like frozen steamed cauliflower or zucchini. I know it sounds crazy, but you like really don't taste them. Um, if you're new to smoothies, I would wait. <laughs> like if you haven't made one or consumed them before and you're like, okay, I want to get into smoothies. I would start with like fruit, maybe nut butter, um, maybe like a protein fortified, um, dairy free milk, something like that yogurt, um, just to get in something other than the fruit. But um, adding veggies is sort of just like an added bonus. So to answer your question, I love, like, I love a good fruit smoothie. It's like, it kind of tastes like dessert to me at this point. I love doing like frozen banana, frozen peaches have been my go-to recently because you can't really get them year round in New York city, um, which is such a shame. Um, frozen berries. And then for veg, like I mentioned, spinach, kale, um, you will, you know, start to taste it. If you're throwing in like two cups of kale, I, you know, I'm going to warn you. Yeah. Steaming up some cauliflower or zucchini and then letting that cool and throwing it in the freezer for smoothies is amazing and such a game changer. And it makes your smoothie so creamy and thick without having to like use up all your frozen bananas. Cause that can be annoying too. And then yeah, like a fat, um, a nut butter, a source of protein, um, whether it's protein powder or something else, um, topping it off with something crunchy and textured. So it'll sort of encourage you to like, like eat your smoothies. I know that's like kind of gross to think about, but the more you can like avoid just gulping it down, the better um, when it comes to smoothies. Okay. I'm not going to lie. You genuinely just influenced me into I'm definitely making I'm definitely gonna make a smoothie maybe I don't know if I have all the ingredients I need to make it by tomorrow but I feel like 
I was on the smoothie train, then I was off the smoothie train. But remembering that you can add healthier, healthier fruits are healthy, but remembering that you can add the leafy greens. Cause sometimes I wonder too, I'm like, when do you get all these leafy greens? in? like, I eat them with dinner, but they're not really like a breakfast or a lunch. Like I'm not whipping out my sauteed spinach with lunch. Like I'm just not doing that. So I'm actually really excited to try smoothies again. And I remember when I used to drink them a lot, they were very satisfying. And there are some smoothie shops where you can have, if you're you're getting it to go, I know that like Juice Press and other smoothie shops, they do have the, you can ask them to put cauliflower. I used to ask that all the time for them to sub like half of the fruit with cauliflower. And I used to enjoy them even more because sometimes they're even too sweet. Some of the ones that they make. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you can ask to sub some of the banana for cauliflower and it's, it after you're totally right. It's so good. I just, wow. You just really inspired me to do this. I'm going to like make everything and put it in the freezer and like portion it out. I love it. Yeah. yeah I'm actually really excited. Tip. Yeah. I think that's such a good call. I really love the combo of like frozen banana, frozen berries and a green or frozen banana, frozen peach, um, and a handful of spinach. Those are all like absolute go-tos. True. That's so good. Do you have a preference on cooking your leafy cruciferous vegetables? Like, do you, do you buy into that whole like raw versus cooked thing? Do we lose nutrients when we cook them? Are they easier to, di- to digest when you cook them? Yeah, I think for some people, they're definitely easier to digest cooked versus raw. I know for a lot of vegetables, like you, you definitely do want to cook them like root veggies, um, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, you want to cook those. Um, For things like spinach, or, um, you know, baby kale, delicate greens like that, um, carrots, snap peas, all of those things will have a slightly different nutritional uh, profile um, when cooked. So you'll get some nutrients when they're cooked and you'll get some when they're raw. So it's like, it's good to have a a balance because, you know, if you're, if you're cooking all of your vegetables, um, you know, as we, as we often do in winter, because we want them to be warmer, right. Um, then you might be missing out on a few nutrients, um, compared to if you were eating them raw, but overall, it's just about getting them in. I think whatever is working for you is great. Don't like, be forcing yourself to eat raw carrots all the time if you don't want to. This is like gold for me. I feel like I've been waiting to talk to you like all month ever since we made this plan because I feel like this information is just so gold and I hope you don't mind. I'm going to be definitely DMing you all the time asking you so many more questions and I invite our audience to as well follow your page because your page is amazing and I'm sure that you all you're very responsive as well to your messages if anyone had any particular questions yeah 100% definitely so we're not done yet I know I feel like that sounded like we're almost done but actually we have some awesome questions we have some awesome topics that I really want to make sure that we talk about before um before we go So really quickly, it feels like everywhere we look, there's different, there are different nutrition accounts sharing different points of view. There are so many different conflicting viewpoints out there, so much content out there on the internet. And I'm wondering, where do you recommend we start if we want to make modifications to our diet? Just to meet our own personal needs, how can you recommend we can identify what will work for us and get a, get information that's straightforward and not biased? Yeah, such a great question. First, if you're serious about it, you might want to seek someone out who has a practice and is a registered dietitian rather than um, just you know a food icon on Instagram, or like they have a profile that posts amazing recipes. And this goes for myself too. Like it's so tempting because it's really accessible. Um, and it is a great option for finding inspiration and advice. Um, but if you're really looking for something tailored to you, I always say to go to a dietitian. Um, and you know, I would definitely recommend that people seek someone out who has their RD rather than just being a nutritionist or a health coach mainly because um, everyone is a nutritionist and health coach these days. Like, like you don't need any sort of formal training. You might have a lot. Like, I am technically just a nutritionist now and have a master's and an undergrad degree in nutrition. And I've worked 
in the nutrition world and different internships and programs for five years, but that doesn't make me an RD. So that's not to say that people who are health coaches or nutritionists don't have a lot of training, but they just might not. So um, I think that's just something to, to always keep in mind when you're looking for, for advice. Um, you know, if you are looking for stuff online, then find published scientific literature. Um, so find stuff that's been published in a scientific journal that's been peer reviewed, and then even still take it with a grain of salt because what works for you might not have worked for the people in that study. Um, or the study have been, might have been funded by, you know, someone that doesn't always have your best interests at heart, um, not to create any crazy theories at all. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's so individualized that working with an RD um, or a, a medical professional is always going to be, you know, your absolute best bet. Um, there are certainly people out there that are RDs on Instagram who I think give a lot of really good tips and insights um, that might apply to you, but you still have to seek out, you know, individualized expertise. That's a really, that's such a good point. Thank you so much for that response. I feel like that was a real reality check. And my other question is if you do seek out a personal consultation with a registered dietitian, do they look at your blood work in making these recommendations to you? Yeah. Yeah. Most likely they will. Um, they, you know, you may have some sort of initial consultation first and then they may refer you out to go get blood work done. Um, and then they'll use those levels to tell you, you know, what they would recommend. So they might see a, nutri a nutrient deficiency. Um, they might be able to tell that you're not getting enough protein. Um, they might be able to tell you're not getting enough iron, anything like that. So good to know. So good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Does food affect our mood? Yes, on so many levels, um, food impacts our mood. So on one hand, like we've, like we've talked about, things like stress, lack of sleep, you know, depression, anxiety, and so much more are correlated with changes in our appetite. Um, so you might realize, you might be someone who, when they're stressed, they eat a lot or they might not eat anything. And on the other hand, what you eat can affect your mood. It's limited evidence, but there are some indicators that depression is linked, so correlated with diets rich in sugar sweetened beverages, so sodas, refined grains, um, so like really processed carbs and red meat. And then there was another study that pointed to evidence um, for a link between a Mediterranean diet. So that's a diet rich in lean meat and seafood as the main protein, um, fruits and vegetables, limited fats, like, you know, feta, cheese, stuff like that, um, on a limited level. There was a study that linked that kind of diet to lower depression risk um, and lower risk for chronic disease. So that said, that's correlation, not causation. That's not to say that if you immediately, you know, start eating Mediterranean diet, you're going to reverse your risk of all these things. But on an anecdotal level, um, you can sort of test this out for yourself by seeing how you feel when you eat like that or eat, you know, a little closer to that kind of a diet, um, how your body responds to things like dairy um, and sugar and high caffeine levels, um, even gluten, things like that, that, you know, might be more triggering for you or that you might have sensitivities to. So again, long winded answer, but yeah, food, in, food affects our mood and our mood affects what we eat. Thank you so much. That's so cool. So actually that was the diet that when I had consulted my endocrinologist, he did say he did for me, at least he did recommend the Mediterranean diet. That was yeah. what he mentioned. And um, I did research more into it. And I, you know, I learned more about what's what what it is, and a lot of fish and lean protein and things like that. And I also actually watched this interesting documentary that studied longevity, and um, people in different areas of the world who tended to just live such a long time. And it was interesting, too, that there was a mention of and it did relate to the Mediterranean diet, but in general, that area of the world had such a social connection when it came to the meal, the meal was a social activity. And they did actually say too, that that was a big contributor to why they think that some people in some certain areas of the world actually live so long. I know that's not related that much to what we're talking about, but I thought it was so interesting and I thought maybe worth bringing up too. Yeah, no, I think it is so related. Like, you know, we, 
when I am at my healthiest, it's when I'm cooking most of my meals. Maybe I'm cooking them with family or a friend, or maybe you're cooking them with your partner. Um, and there's a social aspect to it that helps you slow down a little bit and helps you think about, you know, what's going into your food and makes you happier because it's a shared connection. I love learning about that kind of thing. Like cultures that, you know, generally live longer do tend to have lower consumptions of meat. Um, they tend to have higher consumption of vegetables and the meat that they are eating or the protein that they are eating is more lean. So I think it's, I think it's such a good point to bring up and, and that's not necessarily to say that, you know, your life's going to change if you adopt that same diet, but it's certainly something to consider. Yeah. So it's just such interesting stuff. The information that you shared with us today was so incredibly helpful and so insightful. I actually feel newly motivated to change up some of what I've been doing and just make my food a little bit more interesting, put a little bit more love into it and be a little bit more mindful of what the nutrients really are instead of just looking at you know, other things like calories or worry, being worried about protein. So I got so much out of this conversation. And I think our entire audience did as well. So I know that they're going to be looking for you. I know that they're going to be wanting to reach out. So what's the best way to get in touch with you? Can you reiterate to us your, um, your social media and any way that you'd like for people to get in touch? Yeah, so you can follow me at East Coast Health on Instagram. Um, that's probably the best place. You know, like you said, I respond to every DM. And then my emails also linked on in my bio on my Instagram page. So you're always welcome to email me, you know, if you're someone who's interested in potentially going down the path to becoming an RD or getting their their master's in nutrition, then certainly reach out. I definitely have a lot of insights to share about the process. Amazing. Thank you so, so, so much. This was so awesome. And like you said, too, I feel like we could definitely we could have gone on for hours and maybe we will do a part two. We'll see. We'll see what people we will see what people say when we when we post this. And if we do have other questions, maybe we will do another continue because this was so fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a treat. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. What an amazing episode, guys. I hope you loved it as much as I did. Please, if you are enjoying this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. Follow along on Instagram at my handle, christina.cremitas. I've been doing giveaways. The newest thing to look out for is my Thank You Thursday giveaway post every single Thursday. I've been giving away swag. I have the cutest coordinated sweatsuit sets that I've been giving away, as well as tote bags, hand sanitizers, just a bunch of stuff. You guys should really check out the Instagram and join along. And finally, remember that I am here for you guys. If you ever want to send me a direct email, my email address is christina.cremitas at element.com. I always have all of my contact info in the description. Thank you guys so much and stay tuned for episode four.